Welcome to Exploration 1, Chapter 3. To, this particular chapter deals with how the OSI model application layer interacts between applications and the end user. Uh, in particular, it looks at how this layer is the interface between humans and data networks. Human network generates data, and that's, the human network is a Cisco marketing term, but it really comes down to humans generate data. It's not always true anymore because now we have robots creating all kinds of data and robot uh, bots out on the internet. But for the most part, let's imagine that people create communication. We want them to uh, go access different layers or different items on the internet. And to do that, they're going to use applications. The most common application in use today is probably a web browser. Everything can run through a web browser. Here is a, an example of, again, how the OSI model, seven layers of the OSI model, uh, correlate to the TCP IP model. So the application presentation and session layers of the OSI model, those functions are handled by the application layer in the TCP IP model. The, the TCP IP model just didn't simply break them out into three sub-layers. The transport layer is a one-to-one -one, uh, analogy to the transport layer between the TCP and OSI, OSI model. The network layer in the OSI model is the internet layer in the TCP IP model. And the data link and physical are the network access on the TCP IP model. <clears throat> now, this chapter deals with application layer protocols, and we're going to talk about DNS, the domain name service, HTTP, uh, SMTP, POP, and DHCP. These are all application layer protocols that are part of the TCP IP protocol suite. Here's an example of different servers, and here's what these particular items can provide. Your students probably will not understand these, but uh, they use them all the time. It's very easy for them to understand DNS because you look at them and say, you've been to www.google.com. Well, then you can go and actually ping that and show how that is being resolved to an IP address, and they very quickly realize, hmm, okay, so DNS is what allows me to put in common names okay, for websites instead of having to put in the IP addresses. Telnet, they probably won't understand because a lot of them haven't used Telnet before. And really, in the real world, you shouldn't be using Telnet, you should be using SSH. But for this, we use Telnet. Email, they've used before, so they will vaguely understand uh, how they'll, they'll know email, they'll know how it works, but they won't understand the back end process SMTP, POP, IMAP, those things. A lot of them are used to just Gmail, just HTTP based email. <coughs> DHCP web servers and FTP, these are all the different types of servers that we're going to discuss in this chapter. I think it's important too to show your students this slide and say, you know, there usually isn't a single server for all of these. You know, your DNS server may be the same server that does DHCP and FTP, or your, uh, your email server and the web server may be one and the same. Just depends on your environment. So. Here's a good thing where you can show them the actual processes. So here's Excel running in the processes on a Windows, uh, probably Windows 7 machine, I believe. You can pull this up in the classroom and show your students you know, the different services that are available, different system services. It's also, if you're teaching security and you want to teach security, it's a good place to tell students that you can go look at these processes on your machine, see how many are actually running, and a huge number of processes running is normally an indication that your machine has some type of malware on it. Uh, not always, but it is uh, a good idea for students to kind of understand where this is at so they can go look at their machines at home. And if their machine suddenly starts showing problems and it, the process has jumped from, say, a, a normal of 64 to 80 or 90, then they know they may have something wrong with their, their machine. Here's interfacing with the human network. Obviously, the applications, all of our different devices, uh, we can do everything from sending text messages to a web page to voicemail to video. All of these are just applications that get sent across the network. Now, this is a detailed explanation of what the application layer does. It defines the processes on either end of the communication. It defines the types of messages used in those processes. So it will define a DNS request and a reply. It will define how you get a web page with literally the get command in HTTP. Um, it will define the four stages of DHCP, discover, offer, request, and acknowledgement. So the types of messages are defined by the application layer protocols. It will give you the meaning of the fields, how the messages are to be sent, and what's the expected response. 
If I send a DHCP discover, I expect to get a DHCP offer. We'll talk about that. And how it interacts with the next lower layer. I think the only thing missing here is it also defines how it talks to the actual application above here. All right, so um, the application layer provides services to the applications above it and receives services from the layers below it. Now, there are a couple models out there. One of them is um, the client server model. And this is where you have dedicated servers. And their function is to provide services to clients. In this model, which is the most common that we have in terms of uh, modern corporate networks, you have a server that may have files on it, may provide email, may provide DNS services. You have clients, and their main job is to just request services from those servers. You, know, you may download a file, you may upload files, but in this client server model, there's a very defined difference between the server, which provides networking services, and the client, which requests services. This is in contrast to the other model, which is the peer-to-peer uh, -peer model. Okay. Now this just goes through talking more about each one of these servers, supporting multiple clients, um, supporting multiple different processes, those types of things. But client server is juxtaposed by peer-to-peer -peer networking. Now peer-to-peer -peer -peer networking is where they're, the, each client can provide services and receive services. Um, a great example of this that you can use for students is home networking in Windows 7. Uh, with home networking, your Windows uh, 7 box can share videos and uh, uh, pictures with your Xbox 360 on the network. So it not only, and then it can actually request other files from other Windows 7 boxes in the home network. So in a peer-to-peer -peer network, each machine can be both a client and a server. Now, it, traditionally we define these, this is how we do it. A client server network is used when you need security. A client server network is used when you need centralized administration. A client server network is used when you need um, control okay, in that central environment. And also it's used typically in most modern networks, let's be honest. Okay. Any network bigger than 10 clients typically needs client server network so that you can have a central repository for information and services. Peer-to-peer -peer networks are less secure, they have decentralized administration, they typically have less than 10 clients, and each device is both a client and a server. And here are peer-to-peer -peer applications. Okay. They can both send and receive, you can have, you can be both client and server is basically what, what's going on. Okay. So, client server model and peer-to-peer. -peer. Explain those and make sure your students understand them. Um, if this is their first course, they've not had an introduction to the networking course, they haven't had a server course, they may not understand those concepts, but they're pretty easy to, to explain. A great example I use is if you take two Xbox 360s and hook them together with a crossover cable, you just created a peer-to-peer -peer network, and students tend to understand that. Now, what about our services? Let's talk about DNS. DNS resolves easy-to-use DNS names to IP addresses. So when I put in www.cisco.com, okay, DNS actually goes out and sends out a DNS request to my DNS server, and the DNS server will respond and give me the IP address of the DNS uh, or the, the destination. In this case, www, which is a host on cisco.com. The thing about this for students at this point, they may not know what an IP address is, so you probably need to take a few minutes to discuss what an IP address is, how it's kind of like a phone number for a, uh, a host on the internet. They can understand that and then say, we'll talk more about it later um, because you're going to go down and talk much more about IP addressing shortly. So resolving the DNS name, uh, and this is also something I like to tell my students. You know, did you know that when you put in www.nfl.com, the first thing that happens is a DNS request. So there has to be, if it's not already in your cache, there's a request to your DNS server to tell you where NFL.com is located. That comes back to you, and then you're going to then create an HTTP request that we'll talk about shortly, and then it finally gets sent to the uh, destination. Now, and that doesn't even talk about how ARP is used or, or anything of that nature. So it's kind of, this helps to start pulling back the curtain for the students and how things work. 
on a network. Now this is NS Lookup. I don't really teach a whole lot about this. I just say this is a tool that will allow you to do DNS queries and to test DNS. Um, you'll learn more about it later. Here's our message formats. Okay, uh, We kind of look at what the different types of records are. An A record is for a, a an end device. A NS is a name server, an authoritative name server. Canonical name, a uh, fully qualified name uh, for of an alias. It's for an alias, so a, a C name typically points to an A record. And then MX is a mail exchange record. This is how we know what particular host on a domain is responsible for the email for that domain. I do actually draw this on the board and I talk a whole lot about the fact that you know when we go to www.cisco.com there's an understood dot to the right of com that stands for the root we don't put it there anymore okay so there are root DNS servers then there are second top layer top level domain servers now uh, I have my students list those dot com dot edu um, dot xxx now that's the one they put in for, for uh, porn sites um, dot au australia dot uh, de for, for Deutschland for Germany um, these are all top level domain servers and you can buy yourself a second level domain that is underneath a top level domain um, this is a great place to, to show students Don DNS it's a great place to show them how to buy their own name as a DNS name if they want to for very, very little. Um, but it's important they know it's hierarchical. So that www.cisco.com means this host on this second level domain on this top level domain off of the root. Okay. Now, it's also important to note that when you buy a second level domain, you have control. It could be, you know, instead of www.cisco.com, academy.cisco.com, bubba.cisco.com, doesn't matter. You have control once you purchase a second level domain of how you set up your internal host and their mappings to their external IP addresses. All right. Now, once we've made a DNS request, our next item is gonna be use that to make an actual request for a web page. So we've resolved our host name, excuse me, we've resolved our DNS name to an IP address. Now we're going to make a request to get the code for the page at www.cisco.com. So you get an HTTP request, you put 1.1, you get a get, and most of the time you get index.html or, or, or default.html, depending on how, what's, how you're set up. And back comes a web page. Okay? Now, so, one of the things we need to do is make sure the student understands we've made the DNS request, we can resolve this to an IP address, that takes place, we formulate, we encapsulate it using the rules, we then send it across and we expect an application level response to our request and that will give us a web page back. Now in the actual lab for, the, for this particular chapter, when you do the lab it has you go through and do an, a, a request to the Eagle server web server and it will show you the capture of the packets going back and forth between the two. It's a little advanced for these for your students at this point, but it is good for them to see the actual GET request so they can see how the GET index.html works. So this will allow them to see how that page is requested and how it gets res uh, actually responds to the client to get that request back. Okay. Okay, so now the next item that they show you is the actual SMTP and POP protocols and they go into a lot of detail here on these and a lot of times I kind of blow through this a little bit so that students understand, uh, you know, the, the big thing is this, SMTP is used to send email between email servers, POP3, IMAP, those are used for you to pull your emails off of the servers. And that's using a mail user agent, which is really what we have here. The mail user agent, okay, is a client. You send and receive emails, okay, using SMTP and POP3 IMAP, okay. And those are moved by a mail transfer agent between multiple different servers. So 
The mail transfer agent allows you to transfer emails. And, uh, the mail delivery agent delivers emails. All of this is a little detail for someone who's in a first level networking course. Um, but it's good for them to know. They do need to know that there are different ways of receiving your email using you know, POP3 or IMAP. With POP3, the big difference being that it pulls down all your emails and doesn't leave a copy on the server. IMAP gives you the option of leaving a copy on the server when you check your emails. And then SMTP is used to send emails. And so SMTP forwards or sends emails. POP3 is used to deliver. IMAP is used to deliver. And then some of the commands they have here, the HALO, uh, EHLO, mail from, receipt to, all those are, are just different things they'll see in the lab. So I kind of go, not what you're looking for. FTP uh, is used to move files between a client and the server. Okay. The big thing about this is that uh, FTP uses two ports. It uses 20 and 21. Uh, 21 is the control port. 20 is the data port. This will be important as we go on and talk about security because we'll have to have both ports open in order for it to work. DHCP, again, just another service that is on the network. We use this service to uh, allow IP addresses to be dynamically assigned to host. Um, I do a quick short demonstration and discussion here of static versus dynamic IP addresses so that students will understand uh, what those are. They won't fully understand IP addresses, but they will be able to go, you know, I go in and show them, okay, here's the control panel, here's the network settings, here is a host setup for static IP addresses, or here's a host setup for dynamic IP addresses so they know what they are. But they need to understand that's an application layer protocol, and for it to work, there's a three-step process using what we, what I call good old Aunt Dora, the Discover Offer Request Acknowledgement. Um, DHCP Discover from the client, the server responds with an offer, there's a request, there's an acknowledgement. For the students say, we'll go over this a lot more. And we will go over a lot more as we move throughout the semester. File sharing, this is uh, what allows a Windows-based machine and some Linux machines with uh, Samba installed to share printers and files and be a file sharing resource for clients. Again, just another application layer protocol. Here's an example of copying files between two hosts. Now, obviously, if this is just two clients, this would be a peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay, and so you could explain that to your students. Yes, you can actually use a peer-to-peer -peer network with SMB. It doesn't have to be a server-based network. It can be a, uh, in fact, it could be Windows 7 machines running home group. Other peer-to-peer -peer applications are uh, a sundry. All the P2P apps, uh, they're out there. BearShare, LimeWare, Morpheus. Uh, this is pretty much your best way to get a virus on your machine in a hurry. And so here it is. And so talking a lot about peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer and, and obviously at this point you stress that stealing is illegal and they should not be downloading songs for free. Um, and they'll kind of look at you and roll their eyes like they normally do. Telnet's a little tough because Telnet is not a service that most students have seen. Um, Telnet is a, an application layer protocol that allows you to connect to the console of a, of a Linux host or of a uh, Cisco device. Um, it, it's very old. Uh, it's not secure at all. I would stress to everyone in your class that Telnet is not secure because it sends its information in clear text. And you do not want to use this in the real world. Uh, you know, here's a virtual terminal. You're sitting on a client. You're telling that over to the server, and it's as if you're sitting at the console on the server. Stress to your students they want to use SSH, not Telnet. Um, I would say tell them that Telnet uses uh, TCP port 23. In fact, all of these you need to talk about the different ports: TCP 80 for HTTP, TCP 25 for SMTP. TCP 110 for um, POP, POP3, TCP 143 for IMAP, uh, FTP is TCP 20 and 21, DNS is TCP and UDP 53, okay, and Telnet is TCP 23. That really is chapter three. It's just all about the upper three layers of OSI model. Uh, these are the hardest to kind of understand for students because 
there's there's not a whole lot that you can physically put your hands on here. Um, the labs do a good job of showing them a an HTTP request and a response. They show a, a an actual connection to an email server using Wireshark. So you will have to spend some time on this chapter showing students how to use Wireshark, what each one of these particular items in Wireshark mean, uh, and in fact what I typically do is I try to bring those up in class and show those uh, labs to the students so that they'll better understand what's going on with these particular chapters. I hope, hope you enjoyed this chapter 3 lecture and that it has been useful.